This is Epicenter, episode 318 with guest David Vorick. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. I hope everyone's having a good pre-year-end holiday week. To all of you who will be traveling over the next few days, I wish you the best of luck and patience. I find that traveling at this time of year can be particularly exhausting, but the payoff of being with family and doing nothing for about a week is always well worth it. So I I arrived in Canada over the weekend. I'll be here for, for the next 10 days or so before heading back to Europe for the new year. Today, our guest is David Vorick. David is the founder and CEO of Saya. Saya is an interesting project for a number of reasons. Now, before doing this episode, I have to admit, I was not extremely familiar with Saya, but I'm really happy that I was able to learn about it. It's a decentralized file storage platform, which has been around since 2014. Now, needless to say, it's definitely less talked about than other projects in this category. I'm thinking of IPFS and storage, for instance. But I think it deserves a lot more attention than it does. Saya is a true decentralized Dropbox, and its potential is huge. The technology seems quite mature, and the cost of storing files on Saya is surprisingly affordable. And as someone who runs his own at-home cloud server, I can definitely see Saya complementing or straight up replacing that setup. Sonny and I talked to David about the history of the project, how it works under the hood, and some of the really interesting features it has, like seed-based file recovery, which allows you to recover your entire file library with just a seed, which is one of my favorite things about this product. We also got into David's views on proof of work. David's a strong proponent of proof of work and even started a company which builds miners for Saya. Now, a few years ago, there was some drama surrounding a hard fork of the Sire protocol, which was somewhat contentious. Going into the interview, I actually had little context for what happened during that hard fork. And so my reaction to it was as genuine as it could have been. Anyway, I'm curious if you all knew of this and what you think about what happened. So it's quite possible that we have David back on the show in the near future. He's quite outspoken on the topic of trusted setups in ZKP systems. In fact, I first encountered David when he gave a talk on trusted setups at Starkware Sessions in Tel Aviv. But unfortunately, we didn't have time to get into this as it deserves an entire episode on its own. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for today's episode. Pepo is a community of creators sharing short video content on crypto and entrepreneurship. And on Pepo, you show your love for content creators with Pepo coins. When you like something, you send Pepo coins. And when you want to take part in a conversation, you show your interest by putting up coins as well. So if you want to try it out, now's the perfect time because the Pepo team has launched the Home for the Holidays Challenge. So as we're all spending time with family over the next few weeks, it's inevitable that someone at some point will ask you to explain what is crypto. The challenge is to share how you explain crypto to your family in a 30 second video. And there's a $2,000 price pool in Pepo coins for the top three videos as voted by the community. And to be honest, your odds of winning this are actually pretty good because as I'm recording this, there's only about 15 entries. So to participate in the challenge, download the Pepo app on your Android or iOS device and log in with your Twitter account. Then open your mobile browser and go to epicenter.rocks slash Pepo, that's P-E-P-O, and that'll take you right to the contest thread. And then reply with your unique what is crypto explanation by December 20th at 12 p.m. New York time to enter the contest. And while you're there, you can also check out my entry and send me some Pepo coins if you like. We'd like to thank Pepo for the support of the podcast. We're also brought to you by eToro. Now, if you're interested in getting into the financial markets and you don't know where to start, eToro is a great place to begin building your portfolio. eToro makes trading easy because you get access to stocks, bonds, ETFs, indices, commodities, currencies, and crypto in one single, easy-to-use platform. 
eToro is unlike any trading platform you've ever experienced. If you're used to using your bank's trading or investment dashboard, you're into something. If you're used to using your bank's trading or investing dashboard, you're in for something vastly different here. And that's because eToro is a social trading platform. When you join eToro, you're joining a community of 12 million traders from around the world. They're talking about trading, they're sharing charts, and they're talking about crypto too. The best thing about eToro is the copy trader feature. You can automatically copy the trades of the top crypto traders at the exact price in real time. Now, these are people who spend a lot of time researching the market, developing their strategies, and building their portfolio. And you can copy their trades so that whatever gains they make, you'll make the same profits proportional to your investment. And one of my favorite things about Copy Trader is that I get to see the risk profile of each of these traders. So I can build my own strategies, investing certain amounts with low, medium, or high risk traders and learning from their trades. So to get started, go to etoro.com, that's E-T-O-R-O, create your account and start trading and copying trades today. Now, of course, this is not investment advice. This is my personal opinion, and you should always consider the risks in investing, especially with cryptocurrencies as they are highly volatile. We'd like to thank eToro for their support of the podcast. And with that, here's our interview with David Vork. We're here with David Vorick. David is the co-founder of the Sci Network. David, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Glad to, uh, glad to be here. So tell us, how did you get involved in crypto and what's your background? What were you doing before getting into the crypto space? Yes. Yeah, uh, so I got involved freshman year of college. Uh, this was in 2011. And basically what happened was a, uh, someone from my dorm just popped their head through my doorway and said, you should check out Bitcoin. And then they uh, disappeared. So it was like one sentence uh, that changed my life. It was your own little Satoshi. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't even care that much. But Bitcoin wasn't wasn't really his thing, but he knew it would be my thing. And he was definitely right. So I, I just basically from the age of 18, dived really deep into Bitcoin, started studying it, looking at it, experimenting with it, trying to find ways to make it better. And by the time I graduated, I decided to start a company around blockchain and cryptocurrency that ended up being the Sia Network. Um, so yeah, Sia platform was started uh, by me and my co-founder. We both uh, did it straight out of college. Um, so we don't have any uh, anything between. So I guess I've, I've always professionally been a Bitcoin guy. What was it about you that, uh, you know, your friend knew that you would be super attracted to like working on Bitcoin stuff? That's a great question. I think he knew that I was pretty libertarian. I was pretty pretty excited about technologies like Tor and BitTorrent. I mean, Bitcoin kind of falls under the same like internet and you know fight the man, uh, gain independence sort of philosophies. So I think I think he knew that there would be a match there. So you started Saya in two thousand fourteen. And so, I mean, I only recently learned about Saya. When did you guys go live or what are the, what were the different sort of like iterations of that? Because it seems that Saya has, you know, gotten much more attention recently than it did like, you know, in 2015 or 2016. Yeah. So we launched the first version of the network in uh, 2015, June, June 2015, which seems kind of insane to say that from from here because at that point we were uh, just like panicked about, you know, oh, is, is storage going to come to market first? Is Filecoin going to come to market first? Like we really wanted to be the first platform that that worked. I mean, we were, and then it was like, it took all the way until 2019 when Arweave launched for there to really be a decentralized like competitor. But yeah, so we, we first launched the Sci Network way back in 2015. And then we've just been working on it, building it. I think we're a bunch of builders more than like marketers or businessmen. Um, and so as a team, especially early on before we had you know grown and expanded and kind of filled out the roles that we were missing, uh, we were just focused on building up the technology. And now today we actually have people on the team uh, who, are, who are responsible for growth and product strategy and, and like customer fit. And, and so I think that that's really where more of the attention is coming from is... Um, yeah, we have we have non-builders or pe- people who do more than just write code, helping Sia out. Yeah, I was I was remarking that you guys have a 
pretty impressive blog presence. Like your blog uh, is uh, pretty frequently, you know, seeing new articles and things and like community updates uh, quite regularly. So I think that's quite good. So you mentioned storage and uh, IPFS. Explain how you differ from those two products. Because I think in our audience, a lot of people will be familiar with IPFS. We also did an episode with storage like years ago. But uh, yeah, how is SIA different? Yeah, so I think chief way we distinguish from our competitors is that we're fully decentralized. So at, at no point in the standard like SIA flow or architecture do you have to deal with a centralized party? Um, and so like storage is pretty transparent about the fact that their architecture has centralized elements to it. They have, you know, satellites and coordinators and they, you know, they need, if, if storage, the company disappears, the network stops working. IPFS uh, also has like a similar weakness in that like when you put data on IPFS, it's not guaranteed to stick around unless you contract a centralized, like a pinning service, like in Fira or something. And so on the SIA network, None of these limitations exist. When you know today, when you put data on the SIA network, it goes up in a permanent way, and and because you're paying for it, you don't have to worry about pinning it. You don't have to find a centralized party. If if our company disappears tomorrow, you know the website would go down, but the people actually using the SIA app would would not notice. There would be no decrease in speed. You would you know you'd still be able to upload and download and form new contracts, and so. In that sense, SIA is like a fully fully independent network. Okay. So do, do you think that people are aware of the fact that, you know, IPFS, for instance, has these centralized elements? And why does it matter? So I think most developers uh, that are building applications on top of IPFS are aware because they either, either they run into the problem that their files disappear or they are actively contracting these centralized services. Um, and it, I think it's it's pretty transparent. From that side of things, I don't know if users, people who use apps that use IPFS, are aware that these uh, centralized elements are are in play. But I think it is important because what it means is that some third party has the ability to shut down the app. If if Infura decides that they're not serving your app's files anymore, you know, with one executive decision, someone, you know, some leader at the Infura company can decide to to cripple your entire application. Um, and that really like decentralization is about building things that uh, other people don't control. And so uh, we see we see that as a huge weakness. Um, and, and really, we want to build a web and like an application system where there is no counterparty who can decide to turn off your access to an application or an app. But isn't it true that you could use IPFS in I mean, like, so you're, you're contracting out these centralized services, but it is possible as well to utilize like layers on top of IPFS to build a decentralized network of storage providers, is it not? I think that remains to be seen. The IPFS team would say that it is possible. However, uh, no one's done such a thing. And I think that there would be substantial challenges. Um, another, another thing I'd point out about IPFS, and I think this is also something developers on top of IPFS are well aware of is that the, the architecture is just fundamentally very, very slow. So if you want to open up a file, especially one that doesn't get access very often, it's going to take you many seconds to get that file open. And the way the SIA network is built is fundamentally uh, much, much faster. Not only is it is it much easier and like the, the storage element of SIA is, you know, we started with storage first and then we're moving on to these other elements second, whereas whereas IPFS, the storage has to be like bolted on later. Um, and that really, I think, has a big impact to the user experience. IPFS and SIA are not exactly, you know, comparable because one is more of a content delivery network and the other is sort of a decentralized cloud service, very different use cases, right? And even that, like, you know, maybe a closer comparison would be to like Filecoin, but even that, I think there's some, quite a few differences. And so, Maybe like before we start to like delve more into these comparisons, maybe we should get a good base ground of what uh, SIA is trying to do. What is um, the product here? SIA is a, a progression. So it's a technology that we are iterating rapidly on. The very first thing that SIA could really do is, is archival storage. So if you have data that you want to back up or protect, the SIA network is a very fast, very efficient, very cost-effective solution, uh, robust, you know, decentralized place where you can store your data. 
So first and foremost, like Saya is a an archival platform or, or a backup solution. But the reason that that's what it is first is because that's uh, what we felt as you look at more things you can do with distributed data or decentralized data, that was the easiest thing to build. Um, so that's where we put all of our attention because above everything else, we wanted a practical decentralized storage platform as fast as possible. So that V1 would be sort of like a personal cloud. Like, let's say I had a bunch of files on my Dropbox. Instead of putting them on Dropbox, I would go ahead and put them on the SIA network. But I wouldn't be serving a website, for example, from this V1. Yeah, so V1 doesn't do do website serving or content delivery. However, V2 does do website serving and content delivery. Um, and so as we are finishing up, uh, you know, the final edges on this uh, archival storage or like object storage platform, really where that moves on, if, if you think about the pieces, uh, we have hundreds of hosts all over the world, you know, near many major cities. If you want to download a file, and it's on the SIA network, the SIA network is going to have the, you know, the distribution and the locality and the ability to serve that file very quickly. And so we've been building, you know, from day one, starting in 2014, with the idea of eventually turning into, you know, an IPFS style content delivery network, or, you know, competing with, like, say, an Akamai. That's just, we've known that that's going to be step two, not step one. So that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're pointed for the future. So is this a V2 what's live today or is it V1 that's live right now? V1 is live right now and we are actively building both to make V1 better and to bring V2 to production. I see. So let's talk a little bit, uh, let's start off by talking about V1 and that and like some of the economics and design around that and then we can shift towards uh, V2. So in this V1, could you tell us a little bit about, okay, I have a, you know, uh, on my hard drive currently, I, I have a movie collection of 100 gigabytes, and I want to get rid of my hard drive and put it on the SIA network. Can you walk me through what is the process of doing that, both what I'm doing as a user and then what's happening technically behind the scenes? Yeah. So as a user, what you do is you'd go to our website, you would download SIA, um, or if you want to get it some other way, uh, you could clone the GitHub repo or GitLab. Uh, clone the GitLab repo and, and build it yourself. Either way, you're going to have to get, get the SIA software and run it. Uh, then it's going to have to sync the chain and it's going to need funding. Uh, so the SIA network philosophy is that everything runs on money. Uh, when you upload, that costs money. When you store data, that costs money. When you download, that costs money. And it's all on a big open marketplace. So things are generally extremely cost competitive. Because every single host on the SIA network is competing with every other host on the SIA network. And, and price is a big factor in, uh, yeah, which, which hosts get selected. So the prices are constantly being pushed down on the SIA network. So you're going to have to give the SIA client um, so SIA coins, and then you have to set up an allowance, which is basically just like a, um, a control mechanism. So it knows how much money it's allowed to spend. That way it doesn't go and spend, you know, $1,000 a month or something. But really that's just a, like a, a safety feature more than, you know, more than a, like a critical element. Once you're there, once you're set up, uh, you'll be able to just upload your files to the SIA network. Um, so you will either, you know, drag and drop or, you know, open the folder uploader or there are a couple, a couple ways to put files onto the SIA client. But once you start uploading them, it'll go ahead. It'll saturate your home connection. Um, so SIA network can do about 400 megabits per second. Most people's home connections are not that fast. So for 100 gigabytes, it might take you, you know, one day, a full day of uploading to get that onto the SIA network, uh, at which point your data is on the SIA network and you can download it anytime. Uh, SIA today supports video streaming. So in your case, you gave the uh, movies as an example. If you want to watch your movies, um, this is actually something you can do directly from the SIA network. So you don't, even, you don't even have to download them and then watch them. You can just stream them directly from the SIA network. And then the other thing that the SIA network supports, uh, which I think is really critical to making it a practical backup solution, is seed-based file recovery. Um, so once all your data is uploaded and it's at, uh, in good health and the, and the UI will show you, you know, the health of your files, you can create a snapshot. So there's a, there's a tool, the walkthrough that says create a snapshot. It'll make a snapshot. It'll upload the snapshot. It'll take maybe an hour. 
um, to get everything in place. And then, and then it'll report that the snapshot was successful and has completed. And what this means is that your wallet seed that you use to fund your account also now has access to your data. So if you lose your computer and you have to start over, you get a new computer, you install SIA, and you, you, know, you open up the type in your seed screen, when you put your seed in, not only will you get your money back uh, like a traditional cryptocurrency wallet, but you will also get that snapshot back when you'll have all your data. What exactly is going into that snapshot beyond just my crypto private key, for example? Yeah. So when you upload data to the SIA network, what you're doing is you're storing it on a bunch of machines around the world. Uh, each piece of data ends up on 30 different machines. And uh, to make things fast, you have to, we don't have like a DHT or any sort of lookup mechanism. So what you need to do is you have to remember where each piece is. Um, and you're going to have an encryption key for that piece. You're going to have the IP address of the host and you're going to have the content ID that you give to the host to get the piece back. Um, and so for 100 gigabytes might have, you know, 50,000 pieces on it. So you're going to have to remember all the metadata for those 50,000 pieces. So what a, what a snapshot is, is essentially it, it bundles up all that metadata and stores it on the SIA network in a, and it gets kind of complicated here, but in a way that we can recover it using only your file seed. Um, basically, you give the, you distribute the metadata to the hosts in a very specific pattern. When you're doing recovery later, you can ask hosts for a specific location of data rather than a specific content address. Um, and that location will unpack to all, all of your metadata. That's really cool. So essentially, you could store files in SIA, and this opens up some interesting use cases. So someone could do like an interesting kind of inheritance planning scheme where, you know, they upload something to SIA. It could even be like, I don't know, encrypted blockchain private keys, for instance, and then have a single key that's stored somewhere. And then as part of a will, for example, that key gets given to the benef uh, the beneficiary and then that beneficiary uses that key to get files it could be pictures it could be letters or whatever but it would be sort of a, like a, a lockbox where you keep files until like a later date it, it would be interesting also if, if you know if you guys were to implement some sort of time lock mechanism where like a seed could only unlock files i'm just like thinking a lot here but like where a seed could only unlock files after a single like after some time has passed or something like that yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know if there's an easy way to do that. But definitely, aside from the time control thing, like creating a lockbox on SIA is something that, that you could do today, I believe. Yeah, that's cool. So let's talk about the, the architecture a little bit. Because SIA is, is a little different from, well, we already talked about how different it is from the other file storage systems that exist. But it leverages a lot of different technologies that you know, we all know and understand in the crypto space. So it, it has some sort of a blockchain mechanism, but it also has file storage and it also uses payment channels and, and encryption. So talk about the technical architecture and how all those, those building blocks fit together. Yeah. Um, so philosophically, when we were building SIA, we, we used two like bedrocks, just two, two requirements. The first requirement is that it has to be fully decentralized. Um, and so that uh, decentralization always trumps every other decision. If it's not decentralized, then then we don't make you know we don't go down that route. Uh, but then the second thing uh, that we always focus on and we ask ourselves every time we build something is how fast is this? Is it as fast as possible? Uh, like, is there theoretically a faster way to do something? And if the answer is yes, there's theoretically faster ways to do it. We make sure that we build so that performance is ahead of everything else. And so what that means on the SI network today is, is basically, uh, and moving forward, that the whole thing is set up to be completely point to point. So you know, something that a lot of distributed systems do is they have some sort of lookup routing or, or content hashing, or you know, the, they'll have these distributed algorithms to find data. Um, and that means that you have to ask someone who has to ask someone who has to ask someone, and, and that like multi-hop step takes a lot of time. On the SIA network, every single request is point to point. As soon as you want a file, 
you immediately know exactly who's storing the file. Um, you find that out in, in, you know, in under a microsecond. And then after that, then you can do the, the network request to fetch the data. So I think that's something that's really critical to us. So another thing is like scalability. You know, blockchains don't scale very well. They only get a couple transactions per second. On the Cyan network, you know, it's, I think during, you know, peak times, the Cyan network has probably seen more than a million transactions in a single hour. And of course, that's not happening on chain. That's, that's all going over payment channels. And so we use uh, something similar to the Interledger protocol. Basically, every time you download data, you download a small piece of data. So you pay for it first, then you trust the host is going to send it to you. So the host could, could steal that small payment, but it's, it's very tiny. And if they do, you know they're dishonest, you know not to use them anymore, you know to penalize them. Um, and so, so there's very tiny amount of trust that you extend to the host, then they give you data, then you, you know, extend another tiny amount of trust, then they give you the data. And this allows us to scale very well. You know, we don't need a payment channel system that's as complicated as the Lightning Network. We do data over state channels. So you know, we're not just sending money, we're simultaneously updating the file contract for what the host is, is required to store. So this is specifically for when I'm retrieving data, right? So when I'm, for example, creating a new contract with someone, then I, you know, will make a a new, what, what were they called? File contracts or something? File contracts, yeah. File contracts. And then if I'm constantly re- requesting data, let's say I'm streaming it, like a movie or something, right? Then I use the payment channel. But what if I don't want to be like retrieving data very often? I'm just using it primarily for archival purposes. Do I still use payment channels in that case? Yep. So what we do is is when you create your allowance, what what happens is the Cyan node is going to go and form a contract with basically the 50 best hosts on the network. Um, So you're going to end up with 50 state channels that you use for both uploading and downloading. And so those state channels have a lifetime of several months. And then any time you upload or download going to update these state channels. And so you only need to make on-chain transactions on the Cyan network about once a month. And then otherwise, all activity, uploading, downloading, uh, or even just you know storing and sitting there is going to happen through these payment channels, state channels. And so when I give this data to 50 best hosts, right? I'm assuming there's some sort of Reed Solomon type encoding going on. Uh, what is generally the like best practices here to make sure that your data is well redundified? So you hit the nail on the head with Reed Solomon. By default, we use a 10 of 30 scheme. So every piece of data is going to go to 30 out of those 50 hosts. And of the 30 who receive it, any 10 is sufficient to recover the original data. And so basically what the Sci Network is going to do, because hosts on the Sci Network yeah, you know, they're not unreliable, right? They're, they they tend to be pretty reliable, but they're not Amazon reliable. And we don't expect them to be Amazon reliable because um, that's very expensive and we want, we want to be cost competitive. Uh, so instead, we just monitor and we see, have hosts gone offline? You know, are there, are there issues? And so we have this constant monitoring service that's checking in on the health of your files. And this information, the health information that is being monitored, I presume it's being monitored by the individual nodes. Yeah. So the person who uploaded the data is the person who's doing the health monitoring. Does this information somehow get stored somewhere where the entirety of the network has access to it? Like, is is that where the blockchain comes in? Or like, explain where also the blockchain falls into this architecture. We'll come back to the blockchain thing. So the answer is no, the health, the health is not monitored by anyone except the person who uploaded the data. Um, and I think this is one key departure from Filecoin's ambitions. So it's a, it's a very difficult theoretical problem to do decentralized data repair. So what Filecoin wants to do is that you upload data to the Filecoin network and then you disappear and the Filecoin network will automatically restore the health of your file as hosts go offline. But the challenge here is that Filecoin can't restore the health of your file unless it knows how to erase your code things. If it knows how to erase your code things, hosts can collaborate with each other to deduplicate the data and create this sort of false redundancy. Make things look highly redundant when they're not or make things look decentralized when they're actually, you know, it's it's six copies of the same file on one hard drive. 
And the answer to like, how do you prevent hosts from doing that is not easy. And I would, I would say is a strictly unsolved problem. I don't believe Filecoin has solved the problem. Certainly, uh, it's been one of the challenges for them in launching. So we sidestep the issue by just saying the network will not repair your files for you. You have to repair the files yourself. Um, and so that goes back to your question, Sonny. What do you have to do as someone storing data on the SIA network? You have to run your node every once in a while. It, you know, it doesn't need to be on every day. But maybe, you know, if you leave it overnight once a week or, you know, leave it on all weekend once a month, that'll give it a chance to check in with the files, see what the health is. If any files are, are kind of low on health, it can, it can restore them to full health. But how does that still help with solving like Sybil attack on the host side? How do I know I'm not getting false redundancy on SIO? Yeah, so the important thing here Actually, so civil, civil attacks and false redundancy are, I think, two different questions. False redundancy, we have a super simple solution, which is that we encrypt the data after we erase your code. It. Um, so first you make these 30 redundant pieces, um, and of course every piece is different, and then you encrypt each piece with a different key. So we have super high confidence that at least three copies of the data like, definitely exist, because we know no one, no one has the cryptographic ability to deduplicate that. What's this term you use? Erasure code? Yeah, erasure coding. Erasure coded data means I give you a big set of data. And then if some attacker or some, you know, process in the middle cuts out pieces of it, erases parts of it. Erasure coding means that up to some threshold of erased data, you can restore the things that got deleted. And, and so it, it doesn't matter that things got lost. Okay. Is this similar to how like a, a, a raid would work or something like that? Yeah, RAID is, um, is a very simple form of erasure coding. So I guess one of the reasons it makes sense in SIA, but it's a little bit different in Filecoin, or at least in SIA v1, is because here it's my personal data that I'm trying to distribute amongst a number of hosts. And so what I can do is I can encrypt, to each of the hosts, I can give a different encrypted copy. And I know that they can't convert, they can't be colluding because... They don't know how to decrypt one person's data and turn it into another person's data. But the, with Filecoin, what they're trying to do is more for public data rather than private data. And so they're assuming, let's say it's Wikipedia, right? And so there's no private decryption key. You know, that, that decryption key has to be public to everyone in the world. So how do you solve this in, for example, SIA v2? So the solution that we are favoring right now is that you would actually publish, you'd have two versions of the file. So let's say for a public thing, instead of doing a 10 of 30, you might do a 10 of, of 40 or a 10 of 50. And then you would publish 20 out of those 50 pieces, which means that if hosts are colluding, if those 20 pieces disappear, uh, you still have these 30 pieces that you know, you know can't be colluded over because you never released the keys to those. And this also kind of gives you a nice canary because uh, it, it lets you see if hosts are colluding. If, if suddenly a file unexpectedly disappears, you know that hosts are colluding over, over the public data. But it doesn't matter because, because you kept some of the redundancy back. So I think, I think that's the strategy we'll be using in, in V2 for the, that public data. You just won't, won't publish all of it at once. So you mentioned like the decentral, you know, you really focus on the decentralization as a primary focus. Obviously, the decentralization helps us with the censorship resistance and you know all that fun stuff. But does it also help with the costs of these things? So you mentioned that Cyan cost of storage is like 10x lower than AWS. Is it something about the decentralization that allows this to happen? Or could I have created a centralized Airbnb for storage and I could have gotten the same cost savings? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think in the long term, the decentralization is absolutely critical to how the pricing model works. What we see with centralized systems and services is that even if they're competitive for a while, once they've obtained the brand, once they've obtained the trust, once they've obtained the market share, they always, I mean, Google, Google is a famous recent example. They always switch gears from being, you know, super consumer friendly, super cost oriented, super everything that people want to being this more value extracting prices go up terms of service get nasty 
even if a centralized service can provide good prices in the short term, you're really depending on the goodwill of that entity to maintain that good pricing once you depend on it. And, and I think we've seen consistently in the business world, you know, once a business has established a moat, it cashes in on that moat by uh, increasing prices and, and just making, making things better for the company and worse for the consumer. And so I think in the long term, this decentralization is really important for consumer protection. It's, it's the only way that consumers can guarantee that their service will continue to work as it did when they joined. So let's come back to the, the technical components just briefly. Where does the blockchain fit into this? Because I know there's a blockchain in here somewhere. Yes. Great question. So basically, the chief challenge that we face with a decentralized payment network, right? So, so we're changing value for storage. And we're also requiring hosts to fulfill certain promises. And the big promise is like in the file contract, the file contract says, you know, you have to hold this data for this amount of time. And so what we need is some sort of system that can check in on the hosts and then can decide, okay, you, you kept the data, here's a payout. Or, oh, no, you didn't keep the data. We're going to, you know, we're going to penalize you. We're going to slash you. And in a decentralized setting, uh, I think the only way to do that is to have this, this blockchain where everyone can validate, did the host fulfill the promise or not? And then, and then based on that update, this decentralized ledger to say whether or not the host gets paid. So the, where the blockchain comes in is it stores the file contracts and specifically it audits uh, whether or not the host has correctly stored the data that the host was supposed to store. And then, and then from there, we can uh, you know, penalize or pay the host. Um, so that's why we need our own blockchain. Then it's also just helpful in general. Uh, everything runs on money. If you want a decentralized money, I think you need a blockchain somewhere in there. Uh, but for that, you could use you know, Bitcoin or whatever. So we need SIA for file contracts. So the settlement layer is, is the blockchain. This also stores the contracts between users and hosts and the payments for st uh, storing, but also downloading and uploading files happen over the payment channel. So there's a layer one blockchain and a layer two payment channel solution or state channel built into, into SIA with all within the SIA stack. Yep, that's correct. Okay. And which blockchain are you using? Or did you build your own or are you leveraging an existing framework? Yeah, so we built our own. It's highly inspired by the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, but it is uh, from the ground up. So we wrote we wrote all the code that's in our you know in our software, uh, but it, it's very similar in design philosophy to the Bitcoin blockchain. What is the functionality of Saya that was of the base layer, the L one layer that wasn't available on Bitcoin? Like, could we have done this as an L two solution using Bitcoin-like payment channels? Were there opcodes that were missing that were needed? Yeah, so you have to remember that uh, we, we launched SIA in 2015, uh, June 2015. That's pre-Ethereum. Uh, I believe it, that definitely pre-Tendermint. And so we were, we were working with a uh, much, much smaller technology base. Uh, Bitcoin today still can't do the SIA file contracts. We're missing two really critical things, I think, for the SIA network. The first is that uh, Bitcoin doesn't have updatable payment channels. So the Lightning Network is based on HTLCs and these like crazy draconian penalty schemes that really just don't, don't work with size complexity. But L2 is an example of a network uh, being built or an extension to Bitcoin. And I think if we had L2, uh, we might be able to do everything we need on the Bitcoin network directly. The other thing that the SIA network really needs that the Bitcoin network doesn't offer is we need decentralized entropy. And so we get this by looking at the block hash. So the block hash is, you know, the, the tail bytes are uh, highly random and we can depend on these to uh, essentially have hosts construct secure proofs that they're actually storing data. And that's, that's a bit of a more complicated topic there. Are, you know, because block hashes are not perfectly random, you have to be careful with how you use them. Uh, but the SIA network is careful with how it uses block hashes. It makes sure that despite the fact that they're not perfectly random, uh, every, everything still checks out economically. 
I mean, so obviously the Bitcoin network has block hashes, but I guess the issue is that you can't access that data from within a UTXO contract. That's correct. So that that's the challenge. Um, and so if we got that and we also got L2, um, then I think you could probably build uh, something that's functionally equivalent to SIA's file contracts on Bitcoin. So uh, something that maybe, you know, maybe a lot of listeners don't know is that you are sort of in part inspired me to go work on Cosmos because I, I met you the first time at Coindesk Consensus in 2017. And at the time I was interning at, at Consensus, uh, the Y, and roughly around the same time as when StoreJ or Storage or however you say it, just transitioned to shifting onto Ethereum. And so I was kind of asking you like, why don't you guys shift onto Ethereum as well? It seems like that's the, that's the hot thing these days. And then you kind of went and pitched me on, explained to me why application-specific blockchains make sense, which is kind of what led me down to Cosmos. So could you explain a little bit now uh, to, for the listeners of why not shift onto Ethereum or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a good point. Even, even if Bitcoin had all the primitives that we needed to build SIA on top of Bitcoin, we probably still would have our own blockchain. And, and the reason for this it comes down to governance. So on the, on the SIA network, Every single user of the SIA blockchain is storage oriented. They're thinking about how do I store data? How do I retrieve data? How do I make money from hosting? Um, they're all aligned around this common goal of data storage. And so that means if something comes up, if we need to make some sort of blockchain governance decision, a hard fork, or, uh, or we need to extend the protocol in some way or, or something like that, everybody's aligned around the same goal. And so it's going to be easy to support the common use case. On a blockchain like Ethereum, you have this competing interest problem, this, this political thing where you have some people who really care about stable coins and DeFi, some people who really care about like crypto kitties, some people who really care about ICOs, and then also people who care about storage. And so if the storage network you know, says, oh, we need to do XYZ to make storage successful, and the DeFi people are like, wait, you know, XYZ is, is going to harm the DeFi use case, you have this internal battle and it's it's much more difficult for the storage people to, to push through storage stuff. Or if like if DeFi is the big thing and DeFi is like, yeah, we need X, Y, Z and the storage community is like, wait, that's going to break us. Well, too bad. Like you're, you're a small player. Um, and so I really like the application specific blockchain because it means that we're never every governance decision, every community decision is oriented around a common goal. Um, and that just makes the storage platform a lot more powerful and a lot more um, agile. So when you built SIA initially, proof of stake was hadn't yet been experimented with, at least not to the, to the scale at which it is today. Does SIA still use proof of work? Yeah, so SIA is a proof of work blockchain. Uh, I'm a huge proof of work proponent. I'm really not a fan of proof of stake, uh, although I know lots of people are happy to debate me on that. I think right now where we are with the SIA blockchain is, is actually 95 to 98 percent of our time is focused on the application layer. So we assume, you know, a decentralized consensus mechanism, we assume a file contract, we assume a payment channel system. And then once we assume all those things, 98% of our dev time is focused on using those primitives uh, to build a decentralized storage network. And so you know, if three years from now it turns out that that proof of stake is is absolutely the way to go, or, or if three years from now it turns out that we need to switch uh, our underlying consensus mechanism, you know, that's something we're not really worried about today because doing so, uh, we should be able to carry over you know ninety eight percent of our effort. So I think right now we don't even think of the consensus element just just because it's so um, it's so in flux in terms of the leading research. We're really happy to be proof of work. Uh, and we think we have a secure system as is. And then if we can get more by switching, uh, we're happy to wait it out. And we don't we don't think there will be a big switching cost. Most of the things we built will just will just be able to transplant over if we ever do need to switch. Have you ever thought about maybe using some sort of proof of storage style system? So similar to like Chia kind of stuff where let's say providers don't have contracts that they're fulfilling, but they have extra space, maybe they can use that for consensus. And then as contracts come in, they can, you know, shift that around. Or even if you take it even a step further, Filecoin seems to want to see, they think they can even do proof of useful storage. 
uh, not useless storage like Chia. Do you think that's even a feasible thing? Yeah. Um, so I don't think proof of useful storage is ever going to be a desirable consensus mechanism. Chia, of course, has has sidestepped the issue by by having proof of useless storage. Um, I think they have their own set of challenges, primarily the time element. How do you prove that data has been stored for a specific amount of time? Is, are, is there ways to cheat that? So fun fact, back in, in 2014, when we started building the Sci Network, it was actually a proof of storage based system. Uh, it was BFT based. It looked very similar to a lot of proof of stake networks today. It had a lot of 51% assumptions um, or 67% assumptions. And then it was all based on showing storage and proving storage. And so I actually took this and presented it to the Bitcoin Core developers. And specifically, Greg Maxwell kind of broke it down. Um, and he pointed out all these issues with, with what we had built. And he convinced me substantially that I was not ready to build my own consensus system and that I should just use proof of work. So we, we kind of abandoned that. I, I think many of the issues that he pointed out then still apply today, both to Chia and to Filecoin. Um, I don't think they've solved a lot of the fundamental issues, but also like I'm happy to see the research, happy to see the experimentation. Maybe they'll have some incredible, you know, discovery or breakthrough. Um, and in the meantime, as like someone who's trying to build something that's going to be used as soon as possible, I think proof of work does fit our use case. And so since it's since it's what we know best, we're happy to use that for now. And and like I said, you know, if if there's some big consensus breakthrough, I think it'll be relatively easy for us to move over uh, down the road. So given that we're talking about proof of uh, work, you know, the other thing that you're quite well known for in the uh, crypto community is also a lot of your research on ASICs and whatnot. That day that we met in 2017, you convinced me of two things. One, which was application-specific blockchains, and two, ASICs are good, which heavily inspired a lot of my design for how atoms work in this co Cosmos system. But so... Can you tell us a little bit about why you really believe in ASICs and then why you even went ahead and built an ASIC company? That's a very interesting question. So the reason I believe in ASICs is because it creates alignment with your consensus builders and the long-term health of the network. Well, and the long-term value of the coins that they mine. Basically, an ASIC is a giant upfront payment for hardware that has exactly one purpose. The only way you can see ROI on that hardware is to mine coins and those coins have to have value. So if you're mining coins that have no value, you're never gonna see ROI. To the best of our ability, we want to build proof of work blockchains such that if the network's not healthy, the coin price is also not healthy and the miners aren't getting paid. That way the miners are strongly motivated to push the network forward and, and maintain the health of the network, make sure it's not getting attacked, et cetera. Whereas with like, you know, GPU mining, if one network fails, you just jump to the next one. You know, if, if yeah, I don't even know it's GPU mine these days, well, I'll say Grin because there are no Grin ASICs yet. If Grin fails, a GPU miner can just jump back to Ethereum and they'll see maybe, you know, a 1% to 2% reduction in their revenue, but it, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, they're, not, they're not married to Grin the same way that like an ASIC miner is going to be married to its cryptocurrency. And so we think that's very valuable from a security perspective. Yeah. And, and so then the follow-up to that was sort of, why did you go ahead and start an ASIC company? In 2017, Nebulous created a subsidiary called Obelisk. Um, Obelisk's purpose was to become a mining entity. Nebulous is your company? Yes. Nebulous is the parent company of Saya. Nebulous has two major projects. Um, one is Saya and the other is Obelisk. Um, so between 2014 and 2017, Saya was the only focus for Nebulous. Starting in 2017, it also had this mining focus. And in 2017, this is when a lot of the drama with Bitmain was really heating up. Bitmain was making a lot of political power plays against Bitcoin. Bit Bitmain was uh, controlling a lot of the alts and we were and and also just the general sentiment at the time and and you know my personal belief at the time was that having distributed hash rate was really important and so we didn't want any single party to own more than 51% of the hash rate of the Sci network and we we felt Bitmain was a big risk so Obelisk was actually an attempt to give users an alternative to Bitmain for mining on the Sci network and so we, we did, we created uh, an ASIC company, 
we uh, designed a chip, we manufactured the chip, we designed a rig and manufactured the rig, and we, we shipped something like, uh, I think, 15,000 machines total to purchasers on the SCI network. Um, and, and so for a while, we had some of the best distributed hash rate of any ASIC mined blockchain. As it turns out, I think that the more we studied Bitcoin, and if you look at the people who really you know, dive deep in proof of work, in 2019, and I think this is really just an idea that that started to take root in mid to late 2019, is that it doesn't actually matter if a majority of the hash rate is controlled by one entity, uh, because that entity is still financially heavily aligned. That entity still has to worry about hard forks. Um, so really, all you want from a security perspective is one, an entity that's heavily financially aligned with your network, and then two, an entity that, that is capable of being threatened. So if it's a perfect monopoly and they know no one's ever going to compete with them, that's a bad situation. But if they have like 80% of the hash rate and there's some, you know, there are some other companies or some other opportunity for people to step in, if they get lazy or slow or stop innovating, there's an opportunity for that 80% to switch hands from one company to another. That I think is, you know, is sufficient uh, for a secure network. Um, and th this is uh, quite a controversial opinion. I do think over the next two or three years, it, it will become more broadly accepted. I think it's very sound from a research perspective, but it's certainly very different from how most people were thinking about proof of work blockchains between you know, 2010 and uh, 2019. And so what was like different about what Obelisk was doing is you know, I know one of the things is there's a there's heavy emphasis on open source hardware. What made Obelisk different than Bitmain or InnoSilicon and stuff? Yeah, so we had a couple of really big things we cared about. One, one was open source. We wanted the firmware to be open source. We wanted the hardware to be open source. We wanted the gate level to be open source. We wanted competitive hashing network. We wanted it to be such that, you know, a Bitmain couldn't lock everyone out. So we, we wanted to pave the steps uh, so that if someone wanted to come in and compete with us, they would have as low barrier to entry as possible to do that. Another thing that we really cared about is uh, transparency. And th this is actually uh, important to the person buying the ASIC. It's, it's less important to the network health, more important to the person buying the ASIC. Uh, what we saw Bitmain and InnoSilicon do and, and continue to do even today um, is they would sell a bunch of hash rate. They wouldn't tell you how much it manufactured. And so miners would go in and, the, and they'd, you know, make these projections. They're like, okay, well, as, as long as Bitmain made less than 20,000 machines, then I'm going to ROI and I'm going to make a ton of money. And then what Bitmain did was they made, you know, 150,000 machines and they sold all 150,000. And so they have 150,000 customers who all ROI only if less than 20,000 machines were sold. And the result is that if, if, you know, the block reward for two years is $40 million, Bitmain made a profit of $100 million. Bitmain made more money than was possible to even mine selling you know, ASICs for a cryptocurrency. And of course, this money comes directly out of the pockets of ASIC buyers. Um, and so Obelisk really wanted to fight a lot of... The mining space is absolutely saturated with these uh, crazy dark patterns, patterns designed to abuse the customer and abuse the ecosystem for the profit of the manufacturer. And Obelisk really wanted to take a stand against that. You know, we just kind of realized that Bit, if Bitmain has sales channels uh, and, and they're going to be able to sell, it's very exhausting for Obelisk to try and like shut down those dark patterns. It, if Bitmain has a source of people that they can talk to and sell to that Obelisk doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a communication channel with, there's nothing we can do to, to like stop those sales. So could you tell us a little bit about this, you know, infamous hard fork in uh, SIA where I, I remember I was like peripherally following it, but there was like a lot of drama around essentially it was a hard fork designed to brick a lot of the Bitmain and InnoSilicon ASICs, but not the uh, Obelisk ones. One, how does that even work technically? And two, why was that done? And is that like, you know, potentially a conflict of interest? Yeah, so I will say that is the uh, most stressful and difficult decision that I've ever had to make. So practically speaking, there was no conflict of interest. 
Obelisk had already sold all of its hardware. Obelisk doesn't mine itself, uh, never did. So we, we've we never mined a substantial amount on the Sci network. Like, yeah, sure, we had machines that we had to test. We had to make sure they worked. And that, that was happening on the Sci network. But we never controlled, like, say, even 1% of the Sci hash rate as Obelisk. And, and so the actual conflict of interest was a lot smaller than the apparent conflict of interest. There, there's still a conflict of interest there. Just because, you know, we we did control Obelisk, more sales for Obelisk meant, you know, more revenue for us, more profit for us. But a lot of people assume that Obelisk was mining. Obelisk had claimed at one point and, and had said... Is Obelisk uh, Nebulous's primary revenue? At the time, yes. It was the primary cash flow for Nebulous. And, you know, Obelisk had stated that it would not mine more than 25% of the hash rate of the network, uh, which... Of course, most people assume that we were mining 25% of the hash rate of the network. We had kind of, or I think 20%, one of those. Either way, uh, we had carved out the ability for us to mine a su- substantial fraction of the network. Uh, that we never did didn't help with the apparent conflict of interest. So, so you had all these like conflict of interest issues that both made it difficult to think clearly, made it, made it difficult to establish as a leader that you are you know, just internally to convince yourself that you're making an impartial, correct decision. Uh, but then it made it basically like almost impossible to present to the rest of the world that the decision was impartial. So I think that, you know, that was um, a very difficult situation. But I also think that we we made the right decision overall. And I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, so, so the background of the situation is like Obelisk had announced this open, transparent effort to decentralize the mining of SIA. So one critical mistake we made is we had never established like a policy as, you know, going into manufacturing. We never established a policy on secret ASICs as, you know, just a just a governance tool. But we had mentioned several times that we felt that if someone had made ASICs in secret, this would be considered a hostile action because it comes back to the, you know, if Bitmain sells 90,000 machines to a market that can only reasonably sustain the production of 10,000 machines. Everybody gets screwed except Bitmain. Um, and so secret ASICs come into the exact same thing. We, we felt at the time that the... Sorry, secret ASICs, you mean like a manufacturer secretly making ASICs and then dumping them onto the market? Yeah, exactly. So the only way to make an informed decision as a consumer when you're buying ASICs is to know how many ASICs are are on the market because it's a zero-sum game. The more ASICs there are, the less money you make. We held the position internally and we had spoken about it nonchalantly. We had never established a policy that secret ASICs would be uh, considered an attack on the network because it, it would substantially damage the revenue of people who had attempted to make informed decisions. Of course, what happened was Bitmain announced uh, with one week notice, hey, we have Sci ASICs that we're shipping. And then we discovered through uh, some back channeling that they made 90,000 machines. And again, the Sci network could sustain maybe 10, maybe 20,000 machines. Uh, Bitmain had manufactured 90,000. That's what our information said. And so it was this like transparent attack. Then I received a call from BTC Drac of all people who said like, hey, we've been working on our own ASIC. We've been working with InnoSilicon. And so we also have a secret ASIC. So what you can do is you can break Bitmain and just use our ASIC instead. Which, of course, like completely misses the point that the problem is the secret ASIC. It's not Bitmain specifically, but the action of creating a secret ASIC. So it would definitely every purchaser of Obelisk hardware perceive this as an attack on them. And then because... It was a huge fraction of the committed Sci community had purchased Obelisk hardware. It was kind of an attack on the Sci network as a whole. And so the, this was like the big dramatic challenge. And you had all these people, suddenly accounts that had never been seen before were very active on Discord. We were talking exclusively about how Bitmain's a good actor and how you can't break Bitmain and like just this like whole social engineering mess. Ultimately, we decided, and it really, really came down to InnoSilicon was actively mining themselves as a manufacturer more than 51% of the network. So not only did they dump a ton of machines on the network, then also overproduce, they also kept most of the machines for themselves. And so InnoSilicon, a party that had already attacked the network and, and shown to be acting in bad faith, also had the ability to, you know, 51% the network. That was kind of what 
pushed me all the way over and said like, okay, now we have enough, enough reason to fork, even with all this like conflict of interest mess, we're going to go ahead and fork. But like one common theme that I felt in every interaction that I had with the other mining manufacturers, you know, specifically Bitmain and InnoSilicon, but we were talking to other manufacturers as well was the sort of like manifest destiny. They're like, SIA is a decentralized network. If there's a way for us to make a ton of money by crapping all over the network, then it's our right to do so. And it's, it's our right to make a giant mess of SIA and then make a, mo- a ton of money off of that. And so that I just felt like had to be shut down. So a big part of the fork was also this element of like, no, you have to behave. Like we as a community can make decisions that directly impact your financial status and, and your financial gain. And if, if you're going to be like a bad bodyguard, we're going to fire you. And so, so that's what we did. We forked. Um, and something that I definitely noticed following the fork is that mining manufacturers for other proof of work cryptocurrencies suddenly became a lot more attentive to the developers' desires. Um, developers are suddenly part of the discussion when miners are being manufactured because they realize that there can be forks. So those who had bought your own mining machines as well at Obelisk were also then basically forked out of the network. No, there's this strategy that most, if not all, ASIC manufacturers do. I, again, think we need to credit Greg Maxwell with coming up with the idea. Uh, But basically what you do is you make your hardware capable of mining the main algorithm. Then you also add, you know, just a little branch somewhere in the chip, somewhere in the gates that allows it to mine this alternate algorithm. So it's just a slightly modified algorithm. There are you know, a million ways to make a slightly modified algorithm. Every manufacturer, when they pick a tweak, is going to pick a different tweak. And what that allows us to do is hard fork to tweak the mining algorithm so that instead of doing, you know, mining algorithm A, you do mining algorithm A prime. Or if there's one bad actor and four good actors, you tweak it so that it's A prime or A prime prime. Isn't this also building some kind of a secret ASIC? I can't help but to see the irony in all of this, because on one hand, you've been saying since the beginning that you're for decentralization, and I I really think you you are. But by doing this, by acting as a privileged actor who had access to the community and the code of Sire Network, but also making an ASIC that you could change the algorithm on a whim, how do you see yourself as different from the free market actors that are just producing ASICs in a free market and, you know, playing by the rules of the market, they're allowed to make ASICs and sell them to customers if they want to. And it's up to them on whether they want to inform the market of their desire to do so. So it's important to clarify, like, InnoSilicon also had this switch in it. And we don't know for certain, but I, I would be very surprised if Bitmain didn't also have support for some alternate algorithm. What's the point of them putting a switch in it? Because how could they choose what the next hashing algorithm would be unless they're also the developers? So it's about governance. What Bitmain is doing, what Obelisk was doing, and before we conclude, we should definitely get into the actual mechanics of the fork. uh, Because I think it's very interesting what we did and, and very important the way we executed the fork. But before that, As a manufacturer, when you put this alternate algorithm, this tweaked algorithm into your ASIC, what you're doing is you're offering the community the option to switch to exclude some ASICs and not others. So you're giving them the flexibility to make a governance decision to exclude other manufacturers, but retain you. If manufacturers aren't doing this, the only tool that the community has is is like a nuke, is to break all ASICs at once. If every manufacturer has this uh, tweak that they either disclose to the developers or disclose the community, you know, at their discretion, then instead of dropping a nuke that kills everything, you can drop a targeted nuke that leaves certain parties alive. Manufacturers do this because it gives the community a choice. There's very little downside to the manufacturer. And for example, a possible scenario where we would have or where the SIA network would have selected Bitmain's ASICs over InnoSilicon's is like, InnoSilicon really was like the bad actor in the space. So if we assume that Obelisk didn't exist, 
that made it come to market. Then InnoSilicon came to market with much superior hardware. InnoSilicon has 51% of the hash rate. Uh, this included, InnoSilicon's hardware was superior to Bitmain's. If InnoSilicon had 51% and the network is now like being attacked or something, Bitmain could have come forward and said, instead of breaking all ASICs, like clearly the bad actor is InnoSilicon, we have this tweak that we know InnoSilicon doesn't have, or, or we strongly suspect InnoSilicon doesn't have. Who's to decide that a bad InnoSilicon or Bitmain, I mean, I don't have any opinion on this, but who's to decide who are the bad actors? And do you not feel that as a privileged actor in this whole ecosystem, by making the decision to tweak the algorithm to favor that of which your miners were ready for, that is not a huge conflict of interest. This really gets into the deep nitty gritty of decentralized governance. It's difficult for people to wrap their heads around how leadership works in a decentralized way and, and actually to the detriment of decentralization. In a decentralized network, if there's one leader and everyone assumes that the leader has the unilateral ability to make a decision, that leader, in fact, does have the unilateral ability to make a decision. Uh, we see this, I think, very strongly in Ethereum. It also is strong in the SIA network. However, we are doing everything we can to show people that we don't have the unilateral ability to make a decision. And, and the way we structured our hard fork, I think, underscores very well. Like I, th I think it's the right way to do it. And we made sure that any dissenting minority could opt out or the hard fork was opt in. So you could choose not to opt in to the hard fork. You could neglect to opt into the hard fork and remain on the old network. The important thing about decentralization is that every political decision each person can make on their own and they can go any way they want and be successful. Inactivating this hard fork and inactivating this switch the important thing was to make sure that anybody who didn't like the hard fork, anybody who wanted to resist the hard fork, had easy, trivial means to do so, or any group that wanted to you know, opt out and not follow the hard fork, would not have to work very hard, would have to do very little work in order to maintain the old network. So that was very important to us. And we did, it came down to about four things to make sure that this hard fork was not our decision, but like the collective's decision. Each person on their own got to decide. So the first thing is that a SI network does not have mandatory upgrades. Um, so every time you upgrade your SI node, you have to do it yourself. And that means that the developers cannot push an update out onto the network. So we couldn't just sign a binary, send a bunch of messages around, and then have the default network be this hard fork. So if, if we wanted to uh, instigate a hard fork, we'd have to convince every member individually to upgrade. The second thing we did was we did uh, replay protection and wipeout protection. And these conversations that came up a lot in Bitcoin with the USF and, and whatnot. But what it means is that the transaction format on the hard fork network, on the new network, where we changed the proof of work algorithm, was slightly tweaked so that transactions that you signed on the new network were completely invalid on the old network. And then vice versa, transactions signed on the old network were completely invalid on the new network. So you had no fear of, you know, trying to send someone SIA Classic coins and them receiving your SIA coins as well. And, and no fear of, you know, vice versa happening. And then wipeout protection similarly means that the proof of work algorithms are immediately different from each other on both networks. So if one network, you know, gets more work than the other, Nodes will not switch from one network to the other. They, you don't have to worry about this massive, this other network 51% attacking you or wiping out a ton of history. So the next thing we did was developer maintenance. We wanted to make sure the people on the old network would be trivially able to continue merging our updates and continue merging the code that we were writing for the new network. If we had misread the situation and, and the true SIA community, the, the users of the SIA community really did not believe in the hard fork, the SIA network would continue to benefit from all of the develop work we were doing. We would see that we had made a mistake. We could switch back to the old network. Um, so the line of code difference between the hard fork and the not hard fork with the replay protection, with the wipeout protection, with the proof of work change was three lines of code. 
and they're actually just configuration switches in a header somewhere. You do not need any developer ability to keep the two networks uh, synced with each other in terms of code. There are no merge conflicts. There's no challenge in keeping the two networks updated, uh, which we felt was important. You don't need an experienced developer to maintain the SIA Classic chain. You just need someone who knows how to click the merge button on GitLab. Finally, we made it so that the storage network uh, files would not be impacted. So whether you chose to go onto the new SIA network or stay on the old SIA network, and whether your hosts chose to go onto the new SIA network or, or not, your files would stay intact, which I think was probably the neatest, most interesting trick that we pulled. But basically, if you personally did not like the hard fork, you wouldn't have to go along with it. You wouldn't lose your files. Your money wouldn't be at risk. It'd be easy to maintain. You'd, you'd continue to receive you know, updates as we made the network faster and more scalable, et cetera. It's very easy for the community to reject the leadership's decision to do this hard fork. And I think that's really what separates us from like a Google just passing down to you users. Oh, now your, your Android phones have DRM. Now your blockchain uh, uses a different proof of work algorithm and we bricked InnoSilicon. It's, it's very easy for the community to say, no, that's not what we want and we're not going to go along with it. Final thing is if you, you know, live under a rock or whatever, you don't pay attention to any of the news uh, because we can't update the network. If you didn't update your software, if you didn't know that this hard fork thing was happening, uh, your default was to end up on the old network. So no one, no one ended up on the hard fork on accident. They chose to upgrade to the hard fork network. That kind of illustrates the lengths we went to to make sure that this was a decision not handed down from the top, but one made by the community in a, in a decentralized way. Going back to the fork content itself, weren't you primarily sort of hurt? If Bitmain had already sold all of their ASICs, at this point, weren't you no longer hurting Bitmain, but now you're kind of punishing everyone who bought ASICs from Bitmain? Yes. Which is a, a good point. At, in practice, actually, the only people we were hurting were InnoSilicon. InnoSilicon was mining more than 51% of the hash rate themselves. So it wasn't customers of InnoSilicon who was mining. It was InnoSilicon themselves who was mining. Customers of InnoSilicon had already lost 90 plus percent of their money just giving it to InnoSilicon um, at these ridiculous margins with these assumptions that InnoSilicon knew at the point at time of sale were incorrect, but was more than happy to sell an overpriced device to a customer. Bitmain was in a similar situation. All their customers had already lost all their money because one, Bitmain oversold, so the money was all gone anyway. And two, InnoSilicon came in and completely destroyed Bitmain. So all the money was gone anyway. So in practice, we were only hurting InnoSilicon. But philosophically, I think, you know, if you're going to buy hardware to mine on a network, it's kind of your imperative to do research and make sure that your purchase is not contributing to the downfall of that network or, or you know, contributing to drama or, or contributing to instability, etc. And so even though we're not hurting Bitmain directly, um, I do think there is some moral responsibility on the people who gave Bitmain money and contributed to the disaster that happened. But as it were, we didn't hurt those people anyway. I don't know how you can say that. I mean, like, the people that are buying the hardware from Bitmain are consumers. The people that are buying the hardware from the silicon are consumers. They're looking for, you know, the best miner, and they might not even have that much skin in the game when it comes to Saya. To put that on the consumer as their responsibility to choose the right miner and have to understand all these political implications and all this drama, uh, you know, happening underneath all of this. It's nonsensical. I mean, maybe this goes down to like the application specific chain. And like David mentioned, that's why he believes in ASICs, where he expects miners to be active participants in the network. You can be if you want, but you don't have to be an active participant in the network. You can see this simply as an investment opportunity or whatever. I do want to come back to Saya and the evolution of, of decentralized storage and get your thoughts on where do you see decentralized storage in three, five, and even maybe 10 years ahead? In the next one year, uh, we're going to see a lot of power users starting to put their storage 
onto decentralized mediums, I believe. So probably as a secondary backup. People are increasingly getting nervous about the control that AWS has, about the control that Google Cloud has. So is a very cheap alternative. So if, if you're worried about Google handing down this like nasty terms of service decision, oh, we terminated your account, you don't get your data back, you know, you're done. Saya, for just a little bit of overhead, like a 10% overhead of what you pay Google, you can ensure that your data is immune to this sort of centralized decision. So I think over the next year, you know, we're going to see increasingly people moving that direction. In the two to three year horizon, I think we're also going to see a big shift in how content's distributed on the internet. So, you know, when you go to Vimeo and you watch a video, when you go to Netflix and watch a video, I think it's very likely that that data is going to be coming from a decentralized network as opposed to the current like centralized content distribution. When you're doing live video streaming, how are we making it efficient to like get data from so many different sources, decrypt it and like reverse erasure code it and to provide a seamless streaming experience? It basically comes down to a lot of parallelism. The data needs to go through a fan out process uh, because it, you know, the the uploader only has so much bandwidth. So they're going to upload to someone who has a lot more bandwidth. And that person's probably not going to distribute directly to users. They're probably going to upload themselves to people with even more bandwidth. So you get this big fan out that takes maybe one second or so. Fan out, you know, three or four layers. And then once you're fanned out four layers, now now you have, I mean, four layers is enough to have the entire bandwidth of the Sci network to distribute content. So the answer is, is a lot of uh, scalability engineering, essentially. These can all be done using classical techniques, and then you just make sure that the, that the primitives are decentralized. I'd like to get your thoughts on this, and I'm very much looking forward to having like more decentralized storage solutions uh, available and people using decentralized storage solutions. I, I think like we agree on, on the underlying premise that one would be better off storing their files and their personal files on decentralized storage that's encrypted, that's censorship resistant, rather than on like Google or Google Cloud or something like that. I see a problem with the space getting big enough to sustain storage needs. One of the blog posts on your blog, I forget which one, it, it says that you know by 2025, we'll, we're expected to create like f- over 400 petabytes of data per day. And to expect that decentralized storage networks, which rely, you know, if we want to keep it decentralized, primarily on storage provided by individuals, to expect that storage need to be met by that, I think is we're unlikely to see that. And the reason why I think that's the case mm-hmm. is that there is a trend where, you know, perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of people had storage in their house, right? Like there were probably more people that, I mean, this is my assumption, but probably more people had NAS hard drives or USB hard drives because cloud storage wasn't so prevalent and cheap and even like free but increasingly it's becoming a niche thing you know I, I think i know three people that have like a nas or like a, an external hard drive that's constantly connected to the internet and i have the same issue with like something like space mesh for example which built on the same premise that there will be an abundance of decentralized highly available storage available uh, out there is this something you guys have thought about and how do you counter this you know, what if we go into a trend where people just don't have a whole lot of storage available to put up on the network? This is something we've thought about a lot, basically from day one. And you'll see in a second that, that we answer this problem very effectively. To justify your concern, when we looked at other uh, peer-to-peer storage systems that, that had popped up in the past, whether it's BitTorrent, SpaceMonkey, Synform, all of them kind of were built with this assumption that the people who are storing data and the people who have storage are the same people. And this really like caused struggles on the network. They always had these imbalances where either they had you know, too much storage or they had too much data. And it was, it was very difficult to convince people who wanted to use, you know, say, 10 terabytes of cloud to also have 20 terabytes at home serving up to the cloud. So in SIO, we intentionally and very sharply divorce these two situations. That's why we pay people. So what we actually envision for the SIA network is just like mining farms. You know, we have mining farms all over the world that do proof-of-work mining, uh, and they do it because they make money, 
not because they have some, you know, ideological, you know, decentralization imperative, but because there's profit to be made. So we, we see the same thing for SIA. We pay people to store our data on an open marketplace. If there's a lot of demand for storage, people will set up data centers that are designed just to service the SIA network. And so we'll be able to meet an unlimited amount of demand so long as that, that demand is unlimited at you know, at a price point that makes sense for people to open up data centers. And so, so we have this marketplace and we don't actually expect storage to come from individuals. We expect storage to come from professional data centers that are tuned to, you know, be profitable on the SIA network. You're expecting a sort of parallel data center market to emerge. And I say parallel to the AWSs, the Azures, the Googles of the world uh, that are serving purely serving the SIA network and providing uh, storage for that decentralized network and perhaps even other decentralized storage networks. Yep, uh, that's correct. And what about leveraging existing storage, like partnering with manufacturers of embedded devices and using that as a way to incentivize people to basically pay off devices that they would buy, right? So if you have like a Roku or something that has a hard drive in it, well, then as a user of that hard drive, you're already getting, you're, you're automatically getting back, sort of like you're paying for it with these uh, these SIA rewards that you're gaining from just having it plugged in. We've looked at that a number of times, and I think the conclusion's actually always been the same, is that the economics don't don't make sense. Once you have these, kind of like mining, it, it'd be the same sort of idea as, you know, just having your phone mining all the time. The, the truth is that your phone is not a device that's optimized around mining, and therefore it's one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude less efficient than ASICs in a data center. And I think storage is going to end up being much the same way. You know, if, if you took, if you increase the cost of like, say, a smart TV by $100 to put a bunch of storage in it, that smart TV is going to make the company maybe $1 a month in storage revenue by serving on the SIA network. Whereas like an optimized data center can get that same $1 a month of revenue for maybe an additional $25 of build out cost. Competitively speaking, I think even if the smart TV can lean in on things like free space, yeah, like free physical space, free electricity, et cetera, it still just doesn't make economic sense. So I, I don't see that happening in the future just purely because um, economies of scale are really, really sharp when you're specializing. Very much looking forward to seeing uh, how this plays out. And uh, I know I'll probably be uh, using SIA, providing space as a host on my Synology NAS. We'll be glad to have you. All right. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, David. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.